well, well thank you very much i'm delighted to see so many people uh, online and uh, and 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 thank you all for for joining the geothermal state of play webinar that i was asked by the iga membership to uh, to to do and i think it's quite timely as well given the emergency states that we are all in and it is one way of keeping connected and to be showcasing that you know geothermal we are here and we're here to stay and uh, even in times of no physical activity and uh, very hard uh, getting into the office um, i'm very happy to have online facilities even at home here in germany and to be able to talk to you so i hope you're safe i hope you're well and um, let's start geothermal state of play and i subtitled it changing the narrative and by the end of this talk and by the end of the webinar i would really like all of us to embrace the fact that we need to change our narrative when it comes down to geothermal energy and where we are positioning ourselves in 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 the coming years to come for those of you who are relatively unknown yet to the iga i thought it is timely to quickly introduce who we are, what we do, and what we think is of value towards our membership, our partners, and our stakeholders at large. So first and foremost, we are encouraging the research. We really want to see the uptake and hence the development and utilization of geothermal resources worldwide. We have currently 35 countries who are affiliating themselves with us meaning that their national associations are in an affiliated agreement with the IGA, which basically makes the IGA an umbrella uh, organization. Uh, in the world of associations, it's called an association of associations. Besides that, we have quite a few uh, corporate uh, members, we have institutes members, we have individual members who are joining us through their national platforms or individually because of their own individual membership. Because I think we all share the mission that we want to encourage, facilitate and promote the coordination of these activities um, in order to make geothermal resources um, uh, deployable and implementation of projects on the ground. On the bottom side, you see quite a few logos of our strongest partners with whom we work very carefully together to shape the narrative on geothermal, but who are also keen to see geothermal uh, uptake in the energy transition currently uh, being so much paid attention to. Um, in order to collect thoughts, ideas, and also to be that technology transfer uh, platform that we believe we are, we have set up many initiatives with our partners, with our stakeholders and with our members. Um, ourselves, we have launched an IGA Academy. This is part of the, our webinar is part of our IGA Academy. But we are also looking at technical standards in order to move away from prototyping and reinventing the wheel. We strongly believe in that we should come up with technical standards, whether that is through the ISO, it can also be APIs, it can be through local or national standardization institutes. But what we want to drive and hone into is that we need to have technical standards that our project are compliant with, adhere to, to make it understandable also for our regulators and our market opportunities to be a conformable place and a conformable marketplace for all of us. And that goes into bridging to mining, to hydrocarbon and the geothermal industry. We do sustainable assessment and the protocol of that. And we are capacity building in emerging countries. In a nutshell, uh, quite a lot. And on the other hand, I think with our membership of over 5,000, we are collectively bridging all that knowledge uh, quite effectively, I must say. We have one flagship. And as you all heard, uh, it was with a heavy heart that we had to make the decision to postpone it. Normally it took place, it was to take place in April 2020. It has been taking six years to develop the conference. And as you can imagine, this was not an easy decision. It is the right decision. Under the current circumstances, there is no way that we could ever hold such an event. Um, but again, we hope you will understand our decision to postpone. Um, I'm very happy that we found a date. Uh, it's not easy, I can commit to that, but May 21, May 26, 2021, so next year May, I hope to see you all in Reykjavik for our World Geothermal Congress. 
today. I've structured the presentation in three themes, in three bits. First, the context, where we are at, very much to do with the energy transition and the solution that geothermal energy can and will and must play in that context. Second, state of play, where are we at? What are we currently doing? And what should we be doing in terms of having a little bit more relevance and let's say a solution oriented mindset to really harness the potential of geothermal? And hence leading into three priority themes that as an IGA, um, um, well, let's say our collective think tank, we think we should be focusing on in the coming decades. This is our decade. I strongly believe that this is our decade, but we really have to shape the narrative a little bit more, let's say confined and a little bit more stronger to really tap into that wild and, and vast potential of geothermal. The context, it's very important. Paris Agreement 2015, it's where 200 countries pledged to stick to uh, a net zero future, hence reducing our carbon emissions. Uh, the current, let's say, projection, if we don't do anything at all, is that we're heading towards not only disaster, um, but also to a quite a substantial increase in temperature. For that, there are current policies in place. So the blue line, as you can see, those are the current policies in place, more or less um, agreed by 20 to 30 countries. And that sticks to a scenario where we will see three to four degrees Celsius warming of our planet. And then there are additional pledges in place, the red ones that will stick us below <clears throat> and even, you know, sticking to the Paris Agreement with the two degrees pathways, it's in green. If you translate that to four scenarios that a lot of consultants and institutes and organizations are using, you can see that in the current, uh, let's say, debates and in the current dialogue, the gray one is business as usual. Now, not many countries are doing that. That's very hopeful. Um, we are currently in the state of seeing that we are indeed with the world, if you really look at the global uh, perspective, we are putting renewables to the grid in the sense that we are very much focused on electricity and electrification and hence the current policies to allow and adopt renewable technologies is sticking to the blue line as in the three to four degrees Celsius. That's not enough to stick to Paris, hence there is a call for proactive leadership and ultimately the whole energy transition is to do with transformative change in order to really decarbonize our industry, our processes, our energy system. Transformative change is also transforming economies. The current state, and I will iterate this <clears throat> or point out towards this quite a lot, but the current state of the renewable energy transition is very much focused on electrification. And that is, in a way, a shame for us as geothermal, because not only are we very small when it comes down to renewable energy and renewable electricity in that power sector, it is also one of the, let's say, lowest categories if you look at the total final energy consumption. So power, according to the IEA in 2016, power contributes about 17%. To the total final energy consumption and yes it will change because we will put much more let's say tooling and technologies over the electrification route the car industry i know but still it is relatively speaking only a small portion of what's needed in order to decarbonize our energy consumption transport about a third but heating and cooling is about 50% of our energy demand. And hence, if you look at geothermal, we are actually quite well positioned to play a significant role in decarbonization of that heating and cooling. However, the value proposition of geothermal has always been focused on, or has for a large part been focused on power, predominantly because of where we are originating from. But I really think that with that context of pledging towards the Paris Agreement and the fact that we have a very high percentage of a final energy consumption through heating and cooling, it makes us very well suited to play a huge role in that. Again, 
Blue, renewable addition, the focus is on electricity, as I said before. Proactive leadership, you will see that over and over in the news. I know the news now is very much focused on COVID-19, unfortunately, but if you really look at climate news and if you really look at what's out there, for instance, the EU Green Deal, the climate uh, law, that the climate bill that's currently on the table, this is about proactive leadership. I don't know if you saw the BP new CEO really looking at reinventing BP and making it clear that they are going to be leading the energy transition inside out. Shell, same story. I mean, they're, they're even claimed to be an all-electric company in 2050. This is good news. This is proactive leadership. But ultimately, we need to drive down and hone in on transformative change. And again, this is where I really believe that geothermal plays a role. Now, the third context, very, very important to us geothermalists, is the global goals of the UN. So sustainable development in general, 17 goals that we all want to comply with and adhere to. And that ranges from no poverty, which is, of course, fundamental to us human beings and zero hunger, all the way to partnerships, peace and life on land. Now, in between there are quite a few calls that not only energy is part of, but also where geothermal can play a significant role in. A lot of energy companies are focusing on number seven, affordable and clean energy, and geothermal is of course one of them who says number seven is our goal, this is what we can achieve. But mind you, we are also very much focused on innovating and, and, and looking at how we can transform industry needs. For instance, low temperature ranges for the process industry. That's where geothermal can play a huge role in, in order to decarbonize that industry need. So number nine is our goal. Number 11, sustainable cities and communities, district heating, space heating, all these projects it has to do with providing clean air to our citizens. That's where we sit very well. And of course, food, responsible consumption and production, local to local, greenhouses, agro-food, that's our business. So number 12 is ours as well. Again, this all requires transformative change and it requires quite some fundamental system changes as well. And hopefully under that scenario, we can play a huge part in that. <clears throat> Who are our end users? Predominantly, we have four categories. And of course, power and heat on the left hand, up, upper left hand side is a cooling tower in the Lardarello region in Italy, where we basically originate our geothermal power industry off and from 112 years in existing and still going strong. Someone who tells me that geothermal is new, I do not see that argument as true. It is not new. Geothermal is inc incredibly mature. Uh, and it's incredibly strong and it has been on this planet in terms of harnessing its potential for a very long time. On the right hand side is, uh, is Reykjavik Energy's Headless uh, Heidi. It's a combined heating and power plant. And of course, heating and power together, but predominantly heating and power is uh, of Iceland, so it's, it, it's its forte. But heating and, and having heating plants is, of course, something that I strongly believe that we should focus on. It's a very important end user, the heat end user, the heat category. Left bottom side, tourism, spas, beauty, uh, luxury products. This is also where we play a role. It's a huge category for us and we should really market more into that category. And very upcoming agro-food sector, uh, greenhouse technology, they increasingly are being asked to stick to the Paris Agreement, to decarbonize their supply chain, and hence also looking at their direct source of energy and shying and moving away from fossil fuels geothermal is your logical replacement. And I think as a whole, as a sector, if you look at that we contribute to these four end users, I think we can be incredibly proud. I think we can also do much more, but we can be incredibly proud. Because if you look at the numbers, we are active in 94 countries across the globe. We've created almost 100,000 jobs, According to IRENA 2019, we have 300 power plants in place in over 35 countries. And under these times of emergencies, such as with COVID-19, there are plenty of power plants still going strong, remotely worked and operated by our staff. So we don't really need to go into the field. We can operate that from, from remote locations. And it is just as stable as always. And I think just this needs to be, let's say, mentioned as well, heads off to all of those who are still delivering energy to our communities and to our uh, districts and to our grids. 
Installed capacity electric, 15 gigawatts. And when we talk about heat and direct use, we have approximately 70 gigawatt thermal installed capacity in the year 2019. Those are good numbers. If you compare it though to solar and wind, we are of course dwarfs. And this is also the reason why we are very much overlooked when it comes down to that energy transition dialogue, because people look and refer to us as a very small and niche player, which we are in a way, but on the other hand, let's also look at what we can offer. So I would like to move now into state of play, slightly elaborating on our installed capacity, the projects, the countries that we work in, talk a little bit about finance and about the subsurface for those geology friends that I hope will have joined online today as well. A little bit more of an inside look in our data. So leading countries really in the portfolio of installed capacity for power projects. This is research done by Think Geo Energy, our president Alex Richter, who has done an amazing amount of work for the geothermal sector over the past decade. Indonesia, is the leading country when it comes down to installed capacity, but also what they have in the pipeline. So anyone out there working in Indonesia right now, or who is really interested in developing prospects and maturing them in the pipeline, Indonesia is your place to go. United States, uh, they are the biggest, the largest when it comes down to the installed capacity, and they have quite a bit that they want to develop, predominantly in Western America. And I do hope with all the focus and all the research that's going on on the FORGE project, but also the DOE who have launched the GeoVision report, there is so much potential in the United States besides the traditional, let's say, more volcanic ranges, also for power production, also the, um, the focus on heat and the sedimentary basin. It's going to be quite exciting. Uh, for all of us geothermal uh, project developers to look and constantly look at the United States. Philippines, very strong, uh, very strong player. They have uh, almost two gigawatt installed and they have quite a few of that in the pipeline as well for the coming three to five years. Turkey, one of the fastest, grow fastest growers uh, when it comes down to installing power uh, plants and also combined power and heat. Um, have already 1.5, they belong to the one gigawatt club, so to speak, and they have quite a bit in development. And last but not least, Kenya. Um, for East Africa, Kenya is a leading example of how you structure and organize yourselves with maybe foreign aid coming in from money and finances, but also training local people to run the companies, to do the local maintenance and operations. I think it's a class A example of how you do that. So Kenya, heads off, you have lots to do in the coming years. I think all of us are very excitingly looking at your neighboring countries as well, Ethiopia, Uganda, Tanzania, Djibouti. It is a fantastic geological play when it comes down to the African rift system and uh, all eyes are on East Africa with that respect. In total, all these countries together we have about 15 gigawatt installed which is not bad um, and we have about 8 to 10 gigawatt um, projected coming off online in the coming three years three to five years if all goes well obviously Direct use capacity, split it in two categories. And uh, that's what we normally do when we update that in our World Geothermal Conference reports. Very simple and simplified. Heat pumps, so shallow renewable technology, heat pumps, that sees a big growth. Uh, it was almost non-existent in, in, in 20 years ago. It's now really taking off predominantly in the Asian countries. There are large funds available coming from the ADB, so the Asian development banks. For instance, China just recently got the 300 million euro loan to develop the heat pump industry in China. And it is seen as a perfect replacement for fossil fuels, again, um, and to look at uh, green buildings and, and greenhouses and uh, green districts green districts coming from that heat pump uh, industry. Direct use, again, ag aggregated numbers for um, uh, space heating, 
district heating, space heating, balneology, direct uses of uh, you know hot springs, etc. Um, we've seen quite a growth as well. Uh, it has always been you know uh, for geothermal, it has always been a category of uh, of importance. But the growth really came in, let's say, uh, after 2010, uh, predominantly through uh, direct use for space heating. Uh, greenhouse technology, especially in Europe, Northwestern Europe, is picking up. So the agro-food sector is becoming an increasingly important end user. Um, and the projections are massive beyond 2020. But for the moment, we are quite moderate for 2020, given that a lot of projects are uh, hampering development due to permits, due to licenses, and to lack of incentives for people to really diversify from fossil fuels to alternatives. All this hard work of 100,000 people worldwide and all the partners and stakeholders involved have really, really, really worked well playing it out against how, what we get for the dollar, if you like, for the kilowatt hour installed. So <clears throat> this is a plot by IRENA categorizing the technologies, um, the renewable technologies versus the fossil fuel technologies. Fossil fuel is categorized in diesel versus other fossil fuels such as gas, coal and oil. And it is plotted against the OECD countries and on the right hand side, right -hand side the non-OECD countries. And what you see is that uh, geothermal in red is actually extremely well positioned when it comes down to being um, a very low levelized cost of electricity. So the LCOE for OECD countries is around 10 cents. If you look at non-OECD, it's about four to five cents. If you compare that to diesel, on average, 50 cents the kilowatt hour. This is all in dollars. And fossil fuel ranges, let's say, also between eight and 12, 15 cents when it comes down to well, the entire range between OECD and non-OECD. And then we have the others, as in the wind, um, solar, um, biomass, and hydro. What I want you to take away with this slide, from this slide, is that geothermal is actually quite cheap. And we are doing extremely well when it comes down, um, if we are ever transforming the diesel-fired electricity plants uh, to geothermal, people would win quite some money. And we are even, you know, comparing to other technologies, we are in the OECD countries um, compared to solar PV and compared to uh, the CSP plants, we are actually quite a good winner when it comes down to the, to, 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 uh, to, uh, to the levelized cost of energy because we're only operating at four cents. What I want to say with this is that if you look at it from an economic point of view, it's, it's, it's quite difficult to understand why we are not bigger than we are because if we, if we are so cost effective and if we are so cheap relative to others why is solar you know growing so fast why is wind uptaking an enormous portion of the electricity market and why is geothermal still stuck in a few countries and i think that is really to do with finances the upfront costs and the high risk whether it is perceived or whether it's real, that is the biggest barrier to people, investing, companies, governments to really mobilize money into the geothermal market. This picture tries to illustrate that. And it is a picture from 2012. And it is as valid as it was in 2012 as it is now in 2020. And it has predominantly to do with that we are a resource industry and we are only, let's say, attracting private equity into the project when we have de-risked de our resource through drilling. So what you see here is what people call the valley of death between having a huge upfront risk and having significant costs against that. 
and then going down if you go with uh, yeah I can't follow you can't follow my finger but if you go on the on the on the left top hand side where there is high risk and you follow the black line to the right and you slump into that big ravine after test drilling when you've really de-risked your resource that's when your costs are still significantly high meaning that if you present this to an investor and saying well please up front give me all your money and i and i assure you that we will do our best to um, to make this project fly and to adhere to the business case there is you know if you have 10 other winds and solar pro projects uh, across the neighboring uh, portfolio um, geothermal will lose and and I think this crossing of valley of death has been uh, on the for the on the attention of of many people. Well, the World Bank, Clean Technology Fund, the Green Climate Fund, a lot of investors, a lot of banks, but also a lot of investors have looked into this. And there were there were fantastic initiatives. I must admit, uh, there's there there there's the the. the the Green Climate Fund and the Clean Technology Fund, they are looking into this via, via several banks in East Africa, in the Latin American region and Indonesia. There are all kinds of incentives uh, being put on the table to make, to make the project fly. However, if you want to move away from this, you have to draw in more insurance companies. And this is something on the table for the IGA as well to work in, to bridge that gap and to bridge that valley of death, if you like, and ensuring the first wells um, and to have some guarantees in place that, yes, we all accept that there is risk, but we also need to be very clear that uh, we can ensure that risk. And at the same time, to draw in at the later stage, you know, when the bankability goes up. So when you are, when you're finished with your drilling and when you have a project that is ready to go to market, that you bring in the private equity guys and to bring in that private money because it can't be public money only that is funding the geothermal projects. Turning into the subsurface, I'm still in this state of play and understanding where we are. So we talked about we talked about what we have installed across the countries in terms of electricity and heat. We've talked about money and dry, trying to get the insurance guys and the private equity in. And now it's time to look and take a closer look, look at our subsurface and where we are originating from and what we want to achieve in the coming, let's say, decade. This is a temperature depth diagram. Right hand side x axis is temperature ranging from 0 to 250 and beyond. And the depth goes from 0 to 5 kilometers depth. Um, um, and I've plotted the four categories across the geothermal gradients that we observe when we look for geothermal resources. The average global geothermal gradient is around 30 degrees Celsius per kilometer depth. So on the bottom left side, the dotted line, that's your, that's your global average geothermal gradient. And then we have, you know, two, I plotted just two other ones, the 50 and the 100 degrees Celsius. Now, stick to the 100 degrees Celsius per kilometer depth range. And you will find in those volcanic areas, such as Iceland, New Zealand, Indonesia, and Lardarello in Tuscany in Italy, you will find these type of gradients, meaning that you don't have to drill that deep, but you will find these extremely nice hot resources. So conventional hydrothermal, these are your mature technologies coming from the binary in the flash plants. They deliver electricity to the grid and you will find them on the usual suspects, places such as, again, Iceland, New Zealand, and Western America. This is mature. For geothermal, this is mature technology. This is where we have originated from and this is also where there is still room to grow, but this is very mature. EGS, although it has been there for a very long time, it has not been proven its success to the fullest potential, I must admit. EGS enhanced geothermal systems, hot, deep, and there is no water. So we call that petrothermal. So these are petrothermal systems. We have to artificial create a reservoir. When you do that right, and when you have the right technology in place, the reward is high as well. Think about the Alsace in France. There is now Cornwall in the UK. These are good projects, good, interesting projects. Um, but as I said, you need to do some tweaking and you need to be artificially enhancing your reservoir because there is no natural uh, aquifer or hydrothermal uh, in place. 
And then we have a category that is normally, let's say, seen as something of the oil and gas uh, community, um, the hot sedimentary aquifer. This is where, you know, this is bread and butter. This is mature technology for oil and gas. But this is for geothermal, still relatively new. This is still pioneering. There are places on, on, in Europe, such as Munich, um, such as in the Netherlands now with some of these greenhouses, where they have tapped into those sandstones and into the Mola space and in Munich in the carbonates and in the lime uh, to extract the heat and to deliver that as a service to the communities but it is still very um, very immature when it comes down to geothermal not to oil and gas but to geothermal and then on the upper left side direct use shallow and low temperature this is where your direct uh, uh, usage of the springs and, and hot springs and, uh, and, and shallow renewable technologies, uh, heat pumps uh, sit. So very simple, uh, oversimplified, of course, uh, diagram of our subservice and of our four categories. And um, the argument that geothermal is only happening in confined area is partly true. This is the typical on the left hand side, the typical ring of fire plot. This is our tectonics, extensional regimes, the hotspots, uh, all the islands, the volcanics and, um, and those extensional regimes such as the rift system in Africa. This is, this is mature, but we are still believed to see room for growth um, as long as we sell geothermal in the right way. Um, and if we are lean, uh, enough to make the cost of geothermal go down together with you know bringing in insurance money and bringing private equity from from our groups for us the game changer for geothermal really sits in that hot sedimentary aquifer Currently, as I said, there are quite a few projects already. It's not that we don't know how to do it, but it is completely under, let's say, valued and underestimated when it comes down to the entire geothermal portfolio. I took this picture from a thesis by John Limberger, who wrote his thesis about heat in place and mapping heat reserves across the planet. This picture uh, is at two kilometers depth. So where you would stand now, let's say in Africa, or in Russia, if you would go down two kilometers depth, where will you find a hot sedimentary aquifer between 70 and 105 degrees? And actually, it turns out that almost on 80% uh, of our land space, we will find such hot sedimentary aquifers, meaning that for light industry needs, for space heating purposes, for the greenhouses of this world, for fitting the global United Nations development goals that fits, let's say, being compliant to Paris, this is actually perfectly suited to do that. So we're not confining ourselves to the hotspots, but we're opening up the planet to allow heat and to allow in certain cases, of course, power as well to make a significant part through the geothermal value proposition if we know how to utilize hot sedimentary aquifers. I move now to the key priority themes, but just as a wrap up, I really think that we should focus on more, let's say, more focus should be given and more to do with policies and our legal framework. Um, they are the enabler. They are the enabler for our geothermal uh, energy network. We need to create a leveled playing field and incentives and to have that legal, let's say, framework around it is absolutely needed uh, in order to make that uptake of geothermal energy happen. At the moment, there are 35 countries that have, you know, feed-in tariffs that have the right incentives for power. There are only two countries in the world that have the right policies in place to do geothermal for heat. Now, in Europe, with the Green Deal, there is much talk and there is, you know, lots of potential for let's say incentives around heat and hence for geothermal but it is still relatively new and immature and that we need to lobby for finance insurance companies private equity we need to mobilize funds into geothermal energy we need to map the cash flow better and we need to de-risk, of course, the geothermal project in general, but also tie it and structure it better with the finance model of, 
other types of, um, of, 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 of investment possibilities and not just the loans and the debt modeling and some guarantees coming from individual countries. And then third message within that state of play was really about beyond electricity. And that is, yes, electricity is important, but the big win sits in the sedimentary basins, um, especially for heat. With all that, we've developed three priority themes where we think we should not only uh, work towards together jointly, but also where we think that we should focus on in the coming decades to bring geothermal energy to the spotlight, to create space for geothermal energy in that Paris agreement, uh, well, deals and green deals and policy uh, incentives, but also to matter, to matter to people uh, because we are a local to local technology. So, first and foremost, for sustainable cities and communities, we really believe we should move beyond electricity. The heat is on. We are about heat and we should shape the narrative around heat. Number two, off-grid solutions for small island development states. Learning from the big players in New Zealand, Iceland, Kenya, etc. And transfer that knowledge and those skills and those you know, operational excellence to these islands who are not only facing, let's say, very expensive diesel contracts, but are also perfectly suited from a geological point of view to uh, look for geothermal um, power plants developed in their states. And third, this is about a longer term shifting in the thinking, but we need to adapt a portfolio approach. The value of geothermal sits in the portfolio, move away from prototyping, think about the business model and look at the mindset change that needs to happen. A couple of points towards each of these priority themes. Focus, area, renewable heating and cooling. This is going through district heating and individual space heating. Top right figure is really for houses, the ground source, heat pumps, the probing, etc. This is key to enable a greener environment. Paris uh, itself, Paris Agreement, but also Paris, the city, with the Eiffel Tower on the right-hand side. I think it's the best gap secrets in the world, but the 18th and the 19th arrondissement, if I am correct, uh, is, is fueling its heating system through geothermal. Why are we not talking about that out loud? because nobody is really, really picking up in the news. And this is another thing where I think it's so interesting to see that a city such as Paris is adopting geothermal energy in their portfolio. Um, it goes through the Paris basin. It's a sedimentary basin. It has the right ingredients for being replicated in the entire Paris uh, city. Uh, uh, it is so interesting to see how it sits with you know, the process industry, but also look at how we can use waste heat system integration, Paris, Munich for that matter as well. These are all excellent examples of where we will want to focus on, but also how we can use those elements to shape the narrative further. There are of course some challenges and that is shake up of mindset. I mean, I talked about this before, but geothermal is not known to policy planners, not known to, um, to, to, to portfolio managers of cities, of, of local communities. It's easy to look at solar and wind, uh, electricity first, et cetera. So the, we need to talk about the mindset change coming through the heating and cooling and geothermal in itself needs to position itself stronger, much more stronger than it is currently doing in that change. But we also need an enabling industry. If we really want to grow, we need to have more people and we need to have more skilled people. And I think part of that answer lies in the active synergies between seeking synergies between the oil and gas and the mining industry these are our friends when it comes down to the extractive industry the entire service industry that belongs to the oil and gas industry is exactly the same as in the geothermal industry drilling cementing wells plug and play this is what we do and this is what oil and gas has been doing but we need to join up or let them in in this game Second, 
customized solution for islands. Yes, most of the projects are big, but we need to maybe think about customizing some of these turnkey solutions. There are 1800 islands. This is the back of the envelope calculation of the IGA itself, but we have 1800 islands mapped out across the Asia Pacific, Caribbean, the Balearic, Canary Islands, you name it. Volcanic islands who are ready to be developed for geothermal, maybe not large scale, large infrastructure project, small scale, turnkey solutions. That's what I want the industry to focus on and to think about. Because moving away from diesel is going to help implement the Paris Agreement. We need skills and excellence. And I am sure local people are there. They are trained. They are great. They, we, can we can use, but we need to provide the policy incentives. We need to bring in global operators because that's the challenge still. And we need to have regulation in place in order to allow good geothermal projects happening on the ground. And last but not least, the challenge is still we need to de-risk those, those, those resources because we need to bring in optimized finance structures into those development states. The third theme, this is the commodity thinking that needs to be transformed into service mindsets. I really believe geothermal is a resource and hence we are, let's say, uh, underselling our technology when we are just talking about electricity or even just about heat. The beauty of geothermal and the value of geothermal is coming through its resource, uh, hence the diversity, cascading usage of you know, high temperature to lower temperature, power, heat, fish farms, horticulture, uh, swimming pools, spas, it can all be done in single projects, as long as we understand the value of the resource and as long as we are entrepreneurial about that. And hence, if I look at the projects and where it's happening, Kenya, East Africa, I mean, it's a fantastic example of, of, of already planning your portfolio such that you allow for being more than just an energy provider to the grid in terms of electricity. Horticulture is booming, uh, greenhouses being developed, spas being there. It is a fantastic example of how you can be, you know, learning from the past and implementing it to the future. Lithium. There is an increasing demand for lithium and I think salt and sea at the moment is leading in that. Um, and we are also seeing quite some interesting um, coming, uh, quite some interest, but also quite some interesting projects coming in the UK with Cornish Lithium in France, with the Alsace and Germany in the, in the, in, in, in the Rhine Graben. Um, it's not proven yet. Some of them are. Salt and sea is much more advanced than here in Europe. Economy of scale is something we have to work on. And again, in a portfolio approach, this can work very well to look at the entire value in the portfolio, moving away from just the thought that geothermal is there to bring heat or bring electricity, but to really understand the resource, the brine, the chemical components, and hence deriving value from that. And last but not least, I was recently in New Zealand, and I think you know having so much power uh, from geothermal uh, is allowing you to think bigger than that and hence the, the push for hydrogen coming from neighboring countries uh, is, is, is very interesting to see and creating hydrogen with clean power is something that Europe is dreaming of doing via offshore wind but the New Zealanders are now piloting a project to creating um, hydrogen, clean hydrogen, green hydrogen through geothermal and I think that is just awesome. Last but not least, how much are we worth? I joined the IGA in 2017 and I was presented a uh, news piece from Global Energy News in 2015 where the forecasted potential in the coming decade, so let's say 2020, 2030, um, was about $10 billion. Now, coming from oil and gas myself, where it is easy to think in the trillions um, when you're talking about your final net worth, this is a little bit you know, meager and a little bit bleak. However, um, the current forecasted potential uh, of our total worth in the geothermal industry, it's the same news agent, but then last year, um, is currently estimating our industry to be closer to 70 billion. And still, of course, compared to solar and wind, we might be less 
in terms of value. But if you look at the jump between 50 to 70 uh, billion, it is massive. It means that we are changing the tune. It means also that we have apparently the investor's appetite. And yes, it helps that Bill Gates with Breakthrough Energy Ventures is, you know, investing in geothermal, in EGS, in seeing, let's say, technologies coming from oil and gas as interesting. It helps to create a more valuable um, investment case uh, because it is, at the end of the day, still about perception and what people think we are worth. But I just think that it is very exciting to see that we are now being positioned as a technology that has actually some value. And if I break that then down into where we think as IGA, where we are heading towards, then it is still back of the envelope uh, calculations, but the growth will be in, in, a, in a couple of areas. Yes, shallow renewable heating and cooling. So the technologies that are coming from the heat pumps is going to be massive in the coming decade and there will be lots of focus on it. Petrothermal is relatively small, but the big win is for the hot sedimentary aquifers really through that heat projects. If you aggregate all the projects currently in the pipeline in the European space, in Asia, predominantly through China, then you see an immense amount of projects coming up and coming hopefully, you know, in that pipeline through the sedimentary basin approach. And then conventional hydrothermal, such as you know the hotspots and uh, and 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 those extensional regimes, is of course uh, we call it mature, but still there is so much room to growth, for growth, uh, especially in those island development states and the larger countries such as Indonesia, Philippines, and East Africa. So on and on, I am very positive that this is our geothermal decade. We have, you know, we feel the wind of change through the Paris Agreement. We feel that we can position ourselves stronger than, you know, just being an electricity provider. But I do think that it still means that we have to, we have to shape up our narrative and have to be more collective in our thinking about how we really, you know, can make those projects uh, being developed because the potential is there. The context is now we are able to comply to the Paris Agreement with our end users uh, if we are developing, you know, the geothermal projects currently at stake. But we still need to work very hard on policies, incentives, and definitely the finance structure, bringing in insurance, bringing in private equity. We will, without those, I think the 2015 prognosis is going to be the one, as in you will remain more or less a flatliner. And hence, I'm calling all of you basically to change the narrative and this is our geothermal decade um, we have the right ingredients we have the right people we have the right skills it's not about just the technology this is about creating demand from our end users this is about positioning and hence it is about communication at the end of the day so thank you very much for your time um, for your commitment to uh, go online and to listen to this uh, webinar of the State of Play. I hope you found it um, interesting and um, I just want to draw your attention to a few more of our initiatives. Uh, in April we have uh, Gregor Rundberg, um, IT 101, not only for geothermalists, and we also have a webinar upcoming in June um, for the academics on the, on, the, on the runs and in our membership, how to get your geothermal research paper accepted. We have an academy, uh, www.iga-academy.com, and I would like to open the floor for questions. I believe, Margaret, you will moderate the questions and I'm happy to take, um, yeah, to take them on. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes, thank you, Marit, very much. It was a lot of valuable and concentrated information, maybe a lot to take in, but I hope uh, that at least uh, each one of you took away one key message, whether it's about the mind shift or context or the key themes or a change in the narrative or what we as an industry should pick up on. Uh, yes, please feel free to write questions in the chat. I'll make sure we will answer them all. And uh, while you do that, Marit, we have the first question coming up. So could you uh, say what's the nature of the biggest upfront risks on the valley of the death slide? So if you can go back to the valley of the death slide. Yeah. And... 
Can you see it? Oh, uh, yeah. Yes, here it yeah. is. And what is the nature of the biggest upfront risk on this slide? Is it subsurface or financial or both? No, it's subsurface. The, 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 the fact that we have to prove the resource through drilling, basically. So you have to invest already quite a bit of money in order to test the resource itself, because without the drill bit in the ground, we can only evaluate it via data, and hence it remains a theory, a theoretical. And of course, you can de-risk the theory with some data samples on site, some temperature uh, measurements, uh, some heat flow modeling, of course, of course. But the real de-risking sits when you have drilled. And hence, that upfront risk is the biggest. And hence, I think, you know, if you look at oil and gas and if you look at the portfolio approaches that people have uh, in that joint venture approach, uh, learning, learning in batches um, and hence de-risking it over uh, larger spreads instead of the geothermal approach as in going in for one project and hopefully, you know, hope for the good, hope for the best. Um, is something that uh, investors don't like. They don't like just, you know, having to invest first and then maybe are left with nothing because the drill, after drilling, it, after the first drill was done, it appears that the resource was not as good or less than expected or not there at all, etc. etc. So, yeah, it's okay, I hope everyone can hear us well. So let's move to uh, another question about enhancing the voice of geothermal industry. Now, do existing lobby groups that represent geothermal industry, do they push the European Commission, the UN or other decisional organizations? Could you elaborate a bit more on that? Yeah, yeah. So um, I think yes and no. I think yes, there are some, some, I mean, including ourselves, obviously. I mean, we're doing our best and we're doing the best we can in terms of finding the right um, entry points and the right people at the right level to, uh, to talk to. Um, IEGA, if I, if I start first with ourselves, IEGA is really high level in terms of we, we are the ones talking to the UN um, and uh, let's say the World Bank for Finance and, um, and, and part of the yeah, EU Commission, uh, we have some direct access there and um, we have a sister organization in Brussels who's actively lobbying for those policies, uh, EJEC. So yes, we have, we, have, we have quite a good overview of who to contact. Um, however, uh, still not good enough. And that, that predominantly comes because we are still a very small group of people. So it would be better if we have, let's say, three full-time lobbyists lying on the door of uh, every politic, uh, politician in, the, in Brussels. I mean, that would be best. Uh, and that can also be in Washington and that can also be in, in Geneva. Um, but yes, it means that uh, we have to spread our meager resources uh, across the globe. Um, and that is partial success and partial still, you know, it's, uh, yeah, lots of, lots of work to be done. Um, what I also see is that even when you, when you are successful in lobbying or when you are successful in getting your message across, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's, you know, that is reflected in, in the upcoming bills or climate laws or now in the Green Deal. I can see there is some mentioning of heat, but there is no direct mentioning of geothermal in the, in, in, on the bill. And that's a, that's a huge loss. And yeah, that's nobody's fault. It just, you know, it's just a matter of uh, what it is, but it means that we still have to up our game when it comes down to lobbying. Thank you for the answer. Um, we have another question. So do you think that uh, the current geothermal industry is the right community to meet the goals, the one you talked about, so the main key themes, or do we need some additional contributors like oil and gas companies? Yeah, okay, so I have a very strong opinion here and I have a more diplomatic answer. Um, I think the, the, the community itself, so the geothermal community itself, is perfectly capable uh, of, of delivering on the technologies that is needed. We have, the right, uh, we have the right mindset, we have the right skills, we have the right technology, we have the right people working in different groups and, 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 and organizations. Uh, whether it's private companies for drilling or whether it is uh, geoscience research. However, what we fundamentally lack is scale. 
So the honest opinion is that oil and gas is much bigger when it comes down to capable people in exactly the same, you know, competence framework that we need uh, it, but they are substantially bigger and they have the benefit of once they are really, you know, adopting uh, and transforming their portfolios and divesting from oil and gas uh, predominantly and, and, and allowing renewables to sit in their portfolios and hence geothermal comes into mind then it is a one-to-one, -one, let's say, transformation that can, take, uh, that can take place between the geothermal community and oil and gas uh, subsurface professionals. So from a competence point of view, geothermal is, is absolutely, I mean, we are skilled, we are, we are ready, but we, we lack scale. And we need to scale in order to, well, not only to be of importance, because it, that's a matter of size at the end of the day, but it's also about being able to deliver on those projects because we can map so many different projects. But at the end of the day, we need people, technology, money, but also operators who are able to operate those assets. And that's where the geothermal community at this stage is, is way too small. If you really map those projects into actual, let's say, needs for people and for operators. Thank you. We have um, actually many, many questions, but I hope... <laughs> I'm trying to pick up the most interesting ones. Let's let's try. We still have about 15 to 20 minutes. So if everyone's okay with that, could you give us a thumbs up so we can quickly go through as many questions as possible? If you're okay with us, with us staying another 10 to 15 minutes. In the meantime, there is another question, actually two questions in one. So can you give any examples of a successful EGS project or projects, if there are any, and what are the biggest drivers of keeping operating costs low? Okay, so the first one, uh, it, well, the, 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 the best known EGS project that is, uh, uh, that, 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 that's in Europe, that's in the Alsace, and that is uh, Sultz and, uh, and Rittershofen in, uh, in, in France. Um, out of the top of my head, it was already in, in plan in the 80s, uh, but it got finally awarded funds in the 90s, and it is in existence since 95, 96. So it's, it, it, it's, it's one of the largest um, and oldest EGS projects. Um, and they are still expanding in their portfolio. So new wells, so new seismic, uh, et cetera. So the, it, it's constant addition and uh, not only, uh, so, it, so yeah, so, so, so it's quite a large project. Uh, and that's from the crystalline basement and that's EGS in its, in its purest form as it was intended. Um, and the one we visited, uh, Margaret, you were with me in Cornwall that's uh, the United uh, Deep Downs project in Cornwall. Um, that's the other one that is, uh, that is uh, I think they have now uh, also due to COVID-19, they have uh, postponed some of the testing, but uh, what I've seen so far in the results, it looks very, very good. Um, so those are two good examples, I think, for, uh, for people to relate to. Um, and then the other question was to keep operational costs down. Is it? Uh, yes, that's correct. Yes. Okay. So uh, in general, I mean, if you look at your entire life cycle, I mean, um, maintenance and, 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 and operations, it predominantly, I mean, you, 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 you need to maintain your wells and that is whatever you're, wherever you're from in the extractive industry, oil, gas, uh, unconventional, conventional, you need to maintain wells. I mean, that's a given. You will always have those operational costs. Um, what we see, I mean, coming myself from oil and gas, what we see is that um, the, the biggest risk that the oil and gas people n not necessarily have, the biggest risk and challenges for operational um, uh, for, for, for geothermal is corrosion of the of the casings uh, bad cementing jobs so you really have to do workovers again um, and um, and scaling so at the end of the day for geothermal it is extremely important to get the resource at a certain rate at the surface because it's the flow rate that determines uh, well, the, the, the output, so the, the, the swing of the turbines, et cetera, et cetera. So 
everything that happens in the subsurface that you can de-risk up front in terms of understanding the acidity, your chemical components, uh, do a good casing job, do a good cementing job that will help to drive down operational costs. And again, that requires capable, competent people at the beginning of your project to really outline all these potential risk, not only in the CAPEX phase, so in the capital expenditure phase, as in yeah, those, those, those early stages, but also once your project is there to reduce those costs in the operational, on the operational site. So for example, I mean, all our wells and all our projects are designed for 25 to 30 years life cycle. Uh, some of them are much older and stronger. I mean, uh, uh, older, um, New Zealand, 65 years, Warakai just celebrated. Um, but yeah, there are of course also new projects and we have to see uh, you know, coming. Uh, Munich is interesting to follow through in terms of the life cycle analysis. Uh, they, are, uh, they are 15, 12, 12, 15 years old now. So that, that, that's, that's still fascinating to see how low the costs are still, but that is because excellent planning beforehand. Thank you. Thank you. Guys, please feel free to write your uh, comments and reaction in the chat. In the meantime, we have, um, I think, a few more questions. Now, there was a, a geothermal graph that showed the view, the value of geothermal. I think it was about how much are we, that, uh, are we co cost. Um, do you know what I'm talking about? The value of the geothermal graph. So, so how much we are worth? Yes. Um, so the slope of the curve is changing in 2026, right? Is there any specific reason behind that? Yeah, well, that is, that is uh, part of it is because of all the projects that are currently mapped into the pipeline of 25 to 2030 that come on stream. Meaning that, uh, uh, for example, if, on average, if you look at, at any given geothermal project, it takes about three to five years to properly develop a project. Uh, and it can be faster sometimes when you have real, you know, if and all the players are aligned and your permits are in place and your licenses and what have you. But let's be very honest, it is not easy to develop sometimes geothermal due to lack of permits, licenses and so on. So the idea behind this curve, the way I have interpreted is that if you map all the projects in the pipeline and especially those that have that heating component in it, so those low enthalpy sedimentary basin derived projects, Project, uh, across Europe and across China. They are now mapped for development, so for maturing basically the prospects. And they will hopefully come on stream, let's say between 25 and 2030, meaning that there will be um, uh, the bankability of those projects will go up, meaning that there will be, uh, they will be attractive for private um, equity, so private investors. Uh, to come in and hence the value is seen as uh, as higher uh, after 25 because that's where we have matured or even developed the prospects. Right, another question also about the finance strategy. So um, for the finance strategy, do you, does the approach or uh, will be different? Uh, will the approach be different to all producer countries versus non-producers? Uh, for example, for non-producers, rather a profitable energy will be sustainable energy, energy dependency. Right. Uh, I'm not quite sure how to interpret this question. So, so the countries who are non-producers, maybe I don't understand that question. So what? Okay. So uh, let's do it that way. Uh, the 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 person who wrote us about the finance strategy, could you please rephrase it a bit and put it again in the chat? We will address it in a second. Yeah, and maybe now, the, the definition of a non-producer, because is that, I mean, um, we are only looking at projects where people, or where, where a country, they will on the ground locally produce the energy, heat, electricity, the cascaded use, whatever, locally. And a non-producer, the way I would interpret a non-producer is, um, is a country that imports. But, and, and hence, this is the, maybe the clarification that I need to understand the question a little bit better. Okay, let's wait until the person will get back to yeah. us. Um, yeah. Another one, how many companies are utilizing wells 
planned to be decommissioned as downhole heat exchange type wells for low enthalpy power generation ORC. How many countries or how many? How many companies, companies. are utilizing wells that are planned to be decommissioned as downhole heat exchange type wells? Right. So with companies, I assume that the, the, the question uh, implies operators uh, because typically wells are owned by an operator and that differs, of course, from country to country who owns the right to utilize those boreholes or those, 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 those wells. Um, it's a, it, it, it bags a bigger question than this. I mean, um, typically, if you look at, because I, I, I'm assuming here that this comes from an oil and gas point of view, where either abandoned or stranded or, or, or any kind of well that has, that it has served its purpose and is still there and not plucked and abandoned, can we use those wells um, either from a country perspective or a company perspective um, to, 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 to reinvent and to reshape and to reutilize and to repurpose? Now, the answer to that is unknown uh, and it has to do with confidentiality. It has to do with not known strategies of countries and companies, what they want to do with their boreholes. But I can assure you that this is of high interest and uh, there are certain and let's say uh, uh, groups, um, well, let's say special interest groups who are uh, fine tuning uh, roadmaps in order to, 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 to help, let's say, create a way to circumvent confidentiality, ownership, liability, uh, circumvent maybe or recreate the mining law in order to uh, repurpose those wells for, 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 for storage purposes, maybe even re revamp it such that it can still i mean you know when it's when it's a, an abandoned hole for uh, or abandoned um, field for for oil and gas it doesn't necessarily mean that they're you know it can be reused maybe for for geothermal so it can be you know being re re revived that's the word i was looking for um but this is a very this is a very difficult subject to Attach a number to given the confidentiality of a lot of these operators and companies and countries. Thank you. Um, I believe to time restriction, we will take uh, one or two questions more. And there's one that I particularly like very much. <laughs> what do you think about geothermal industry after the pandemic? Uh, will the affected countries absolutely try to stabilize their economy is it a chance ah nice okay so um well if i had a crystal ball i would tell you of course uh, everything but um yeah it's, it's 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 a really interesting question i think uh first first and foremost i hope that everybody stay stays well and uh, i think that that this is a terrible pandemic and um it has it is affecting us maybe hopefully at least not everybody personally, but then let's say indirectly it will affect all of us because after the pandemic is in control, let's say, and if we have, you know, back to our normal lives, I think we will face some economic downturn that is unprecedented. And hence, um, I can see a few scenarios developing. One is, yeah, going back to business as usual, trying to revive the economy and, 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 some even say it's 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 the best thing for oil and gas because everybody will be happy to have oil and gas around because they are a stable supplier obviously of energy and hence the whole focus on renewable is going to be shifted towards a later stage once we are back on our economy and the other scenario says well actually people have changed you know um, because they will change their behavior and hence um, such as the IEA has also recently launched uh, an opinion piece that says now is actually the time for renewables because we are here we can you know we we don't we, we are not volatile in terms of our pricing uh, we don't drop uh, as fast as, uh, as, as 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 oil uh, we don't do uh, these geopolitics uh, russia saudi in fights uh, over the opec uh, strategy um, yeah but i think for geothermal because that's that's the, the big question that uh, that is behind this for geothermal i think uh, we should uh, keep doing what we do good and, and, and be better in, in, in what we are 
currently not doing so well. What we're doing good is our technology. I mean, we are technology people and we are good at what we do. We operate our wells very effectively. We are, we are, we are strong in the technical subsurface uh, um, competence. Um, what I think we should do better is the narrative. And what I think we should do more is create demand for geothermal. And there is the opportunity, I think, even after, you know, after the pandemic and, and, and with an economic downturn, is that by the end of the day, everybody needs energy. And if we can solidly, consistently provide the case for geothermal that we are not only cheap, relatively speaking, the best uh, compared to, um, to the other technologies, but that we are also base loading. We are reliable. We operate 24 hours a day. We are, you know, regardless of people being working at home or, or whatever, I mean, we're there. We are not dependent. Uh, we are resilient and we can withstand almost any, you know, anything. And hence, I think this is the opportunity to, to really shape again, that narrative and to create demand with our end users. But that's something we need to step up and do collectively. Thanks. Uh, I believe we'll take the last question, um, which is the following. How does the carbon footprint of geothermal compare to wind and solar when the need to extract their components is considered? So just the carbon footprint um, and the need to, what was the final bit? So how does the carbon footprint of geothermal compare to wind and solar? If you consider the uh, need to extract the components. If you need to consider ex extract the components. Okay. Um, well, when it, when it is purely about carbon, I, 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 I don't see the extracted components, but but what I but I what I do know is that um, relatively speaking, we are you know we are we are a, a low emitter of carbon uh, dioxide. Uh, in certain projects, we have a bit more. For instance, in the Netherlands, where we produce gas with our projects, uh, there is a bit of CO two, um, but we're very capable of um, of of. Um, um, putting that back uh, or to minimize the emissions uh, in, in any other, in, 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 in certain ways. So our carbon footprint is actually, is actually extremely low. How they compare to solar and wind over the entire life cycle, I would not know because the, the production line of solar farms and, so, and, and wind farms to me is, 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 is I don't know, I've never looked into that. Um, but what I do know is that uh, our life cycle is exceedingly long, uh, meaning that uh, on a life cycle of uh, 30 years to even, you know, in, in, Ze in New Zealand, for instance, like 60, 65 years, we are uh, having a, a zero footprint when it comes to carbon. Uh, and I think that is the interest that this question uh, brings out is solar and wind is still relatively new. They, they don't have track records of 60 years and uh, their life cycle is not so known uh, in the sense uh, in, uh, on, on that longer timeline. And hence it will be very interesting to look at that carbon uh, footprint. Um, and even more interesting uh, is the raw, uh, the raw materials and uh, the need for raw materials materials for wind is extremely high, while the need for uh, raw materials for geothermal is extremely low. Um, besides that, we are producing raw materials for the clean energy revolution. So I think it is, it is an interesting question to just look at carbon uh, footprint, but I think the life cycle analysis and the component extraction for the entire clean uh, energy framework is, uh, is, is much bigger than, than just the carbon footprint of a geothermal project. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Marit, so much. Uh, I found it very, very valuable. And judging from the comments and the feedback of the uh, participants, they liked it a lot too. <laughs> and, I'm happy to hear it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. For, uh, Marit, thank you again. Thank you, each and every one of you, for joining us. Yes, we will be sharing the slides and you will get a link to the recording a few hours uh, or a few days after uh, the webinar. So yes, you will be able to go through it again if you need. And if you have some outstanding questions to Marit that we have not touched upon, please feel free to write us an email. <laughs> we will make sure we'll answer your question. Thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure. Enjoy your day and please stay safe. Thank you. <laughs>